Amen. Thank you, Breck. When I was six years old, my family moved to a new home on the edge of town. It was a neighborhood that was, I felt like it was the last neighborhood on earth it might have been because after that there was woods and a creek and a field and it seemed to go on and on forever. And so soon after we moved in, my cousin and I, my older cousin, I was six and so my older cousin was seven. He was much older than me. We went down to the end of the road and went to play in the creek. We had permission. You could do that sort of thing back then. And we played in the creek for, the, for most of the day and then we decided that we would go across the creek into that field and we explored and walked around in that field and we discovered an old barn. It had uh, really cool things in it. It had, uh, you know, old horseshoes in it and some, uh, you know, some tools and implements and things like that and it was really amazing. Well, after a little while, we decided it might be time for us to head back home and we started walking and uh, we realized quickly that we were we, we couldn't see where to go. I was unfamiliar with the, the location, and the, the weeds and grass was really tall. And little boys, we couldn't really see. We couldn't see from there which direction to go home. And we walked. It seemed like hours. It may have been minutes, but it seemed to us forever. And we were absolutely terrified that we thought we would never get out of that meadow, that we would be lost forever. And so my cousin and I decided that we, without being able to find our way, we decided we better pray. And so we did. And we prayed and we asked God to help us find our way home and save us. And do you know that not much farther, not much, not much time after that, we still lost. We decided that we'll just have to just try and go this direction as long as we can and maybe that'll be the right direction. And sure enough, after a little while, there was the creek. And once we found the creek, then we found where we got in it. We found how to get across and then back home to our neighborhood. Now, you might say to yourself, that sounds uh, like an interesting story, very personal testimony. But to a little boy, to a six-year-old boy and a seven, his seven-year-old cousin, that was a true blessing from God who had saved us and protected us from being lost there. And I've never, from that point on, I've never forgotten how God spoke to me in that time, how I was terrified and afraid, and I pled and asked God to help. And God brought the help to a six-year-old boy who needed it right then. And I've never forgot that testimony. My cousin and I, for years later after that, we'd look at each other every now and then, and we'd say, Remember that time we were lost in that meadow and we'd nod our heads? We'd still, re- if I called him up today, we, he would still remember that. And we'd almost start, begin to bring a tear to your eye to remember how God had redeemed and protected a little boy. Now that was, that was the way that God spoke to me early in my life about his presence and whether he was real or not and whether I could pray to him and whether my prayers would be answered. Now some of you might say, Well, it's a very personal testimony. It sounds like a coincidence. You know, if you did any direction you would have walked, you'd eventually hit a road and found uh, safety. Well, that may be. But but I am convinced that, that God spoke to me in a particular way in that time. And that is the value of a testimony, especially a testimony that I share with my cousin. He and I, he was witness to me and I was witness to him that both of us were at our wit's end, trusting in the Lord. And God answered our prayer. So that's the value of a shared testimony. Our scripture today that we have touches on the value of a shared testimony. The value of a shared testimony. Psalm 124. So if you wouldn't mind, bow your head with me, please, as we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we praise you. And thank you for this treasure of your holy word that is brought to us and given to us by your hand. That you have a word for us and a message for us to hear this morning. Lord, thank you for uh, this, this psalm. I pray that you open our eyes to it. Help us to read it and understand it. And to be taught, Lord, uh, by your Holy Spirit. Uh, to to uh, live by it and to be changed by it. 
thank you for your presence here with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is the next psalm in our Home Again series, uh, a psalm of ascents. Uh, psalm 120 through 134 are labeled the psalm of ascent, Psalms of Ascent. And we're going through those uh, during this uh, time period this summer. As you rem- remember that the Psalms are a book of so- songs. The Psalms are a book of songs. Uh, most of them are attributed to David. Uh, and this one is one that is attributed to David. Uh, they're, as you read through them, we know that they were sung, but there were also prayers. As you read the way they're, they're written, a lot of, oftentimes they're prayers. Sometimes they're pray, prayers of high praise. Sometimes they're prayers of low lament and everything in between. But this was the songbook of uh, centuries, generations of those who called upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Peter, James, John, Jesus, the disciples, they, this was their songbook, and these were their familiar songs. And so uh, this, uh, this psalm is one of, is one of those. Uh, now, they're called ascent psalms, as Justin reminded us. Uh, ascent means to go up. And so it's figurative and literal. It's a figurative word, meaning going up to worship God or being ready to be in the presence of God, to, to gather together to worship God. But also, if people who are on a pilgrimage to go to Jerusalem to worship, uh, if you're there in the territory, you see that that is a, a high place in the area. The city of Jerusalem is on, is on a very high place. And so you quite literally are going up to worship God when you go back to Jerusalem to worship God. And uh, we've been referring to these as road trip songs. I don't know about you, but uh, there are certain times when you're traveling and you hear a song on the radio and it just gets you right here, you know? You just got to sing along with it. And what's really good is when someone also knows the song and they want to sing along with it too. That's, uh, that's one of those kind of things. Sometimes you start singing a song and nobody knows it, and you feel a little bit funny for a little while. So uh, uh, anyway, Psalm 124, I'm sure, would ring a bell with somebody's ear. So uh, this is separated into three sections. It's just eight verses. It's eight verses. Uh, wouldn't be hard to memorize if you wanted to memorize an entire, uh, an entire psalm. There's only eight. And it's in three sections. So the first section is uh, verse 1 through 5. These are a a grouping of if-then statements, if-then statements. And uh, there's something special about those. I don't know if anybody who's ever had to deal with if-then statements, maybe in programming or uh, something else, you you might think this, this sounds really dull. But the Scripture does something different here. The if is doubled. It's mentioned twice. Notice there in verse 1, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, and then a, a phrase, and then verse 2, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. So the if is pre- repeated twice. And in Scripture, when things are repeated twice, it is for added emphasis. It is for calling our attention to it. And sometimes things are gone to the third level. Sometimes something is repeated three times. Sometimes things are repeated three times. Here the if is repeated twice. Later on we'll see there are three then statements. So it's an if-then statement with two ifs and three thens. Now notice something right in the middle of our two if statements. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. There's a phrase that's sandwiched in between. Let Israel now say, with a couple of dashes. And as I read that, it almost sounds like the psalmist is clapping his hands and saying, Listen up, Israel. Let Israel now say, If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. It's like he's trying to get the attention of the worshipers. That this is important. This is something, not that the whole scripture, of course the whole scripture is important, but right here, the psalmist noticed there's a time when maybe you're not quite getting this. Let's repeat it twice, and I'm going to call you out on it. 
let Israel now say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. Now think about that for a minute. When uh, just that one statement by itself, it had not been for the Lord. It's, it's stated in the negative, which is usually seen as a kind of a weak way to state something, to state something in the negative. It had, if it had not been for the Lord. But notice, the Lord, this centers the Lord as uh, the center of this psalm. I mentioned before, this is a psalm about a testimony. A lot of times a testimony sounds like it's about the person giving the testimony, just like that story I just told you. But that's not so. What's central is the Lord. What's central is God. You know, a walk in the field with your cousin is just an ordinary day until you realize your life depends on God. God is central. And this psalm is that way. If it had not been for the Lord, it recognizes and proclaims that the Lord is the center of this psalm. Also, you'll notice that Lord is written in all caps. Capital L-O-R-D. Did you notice that? Instead of capital L, little O-R-D. It's all caps. Now, the way the printers print scripture, uh, it, when we see our English translation, they reserve that type, the capital L-O-R-D, to refer to when the underlying text uses the name Yahweh. The name Yahweh. And uh, Yahweh was a, is a holy and revered name. This is the name that God gave himself when Moses at the burning bush asked God, Who shall I tell them is sending me? And God answered him, I am that I am. And that's what the four letters for the word Yahweh come from, is that statement that God made of himself, I am, I am who I am. And look, when you see in your Bible, whenever you see Lord, all in bold type, all in caps, that's the, that's the underlying uh, Hebrew word there. So this is one of those psalms. It's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of a sense. It's a psalm of uh, the value of a, of a combined testimony. And it's a psalm from uh, r reminding us that God is central, that Yahweh is central. So the next part of that first sentence, who was on our side? If it had not been for the Lord, who was on our side? Now that's a very comforting statement, but it is a very bold statement. If somebody walked up to you out of the blue and said, God is on my side, that would be a pretty bold statement, wouldn't it? It's pretty easy to say. But is that the, really the way it works? Is that the way it works? Do we pray and say, God, I've got a lot of things to do today. Sure would be nice if you were on my side helping me out along the way. Make sure I get a parking space up close. Make sure I don't get any speeding tickets. Make sure I catch all those green lights. Come on, God, help me out. That doesn't sound like the way to approach God, does it? No, it doesn't. Do we pray to ask God to be on our side? No. What we pray for, God, make me to be on your side. God, make me to follow you. Make me to be where you are. That's our prayer. Now, I'm not arguing with Scripture here, but what I want to do is mention that the, the way that this Scripture is written, it, it, it describes... The same way that uh, Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus taught us to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as a Christian, as a believer, if our desire is for God's will to be done, and for God's will to be done in my life, and your life, if we are praying for God's will to be done, then... We can truly say God is on our side in that sense because we've really been praying that God would put us on his side. Let's look at this a little, 
uh, a little deeper. The way it's written here reminds me of what's recorded in John chapter 11. This is an instant when... Remember that John and his disciples had some close friends. Martha, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were close friends of Jesus and his disciples. And they lived in Bethany, which was near Jerusalem. But there was a time when the disciples of Jesus knew that it was dangerous for Jesus to be in Jerusalem because the closer he got to Jerusalem, the more likely it would be that he would be arrested and, uh, and uh, captured or punished or harmed or put to death or something like that. So they were not necessarily uh, eager to head to Jerusalem. But word came that Lazarus was sick. Sick to the point of death. Do you remember this? And so uh, they heard that uh, Lazarus was sick. And Jesus heard the news and waited for a couple of days before they started uh, heading towards uh, Jerusalem. John chapter 11, verse 14. Uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 11, verse 4. When Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, for it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So Jesus has told his disciples the purpose of Lazarus' death. This is an example that sometimes even the most horrible tragedy is for a greater purpose. And Jesus was telling his disciples this. In verse 14, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let's go to him. All right. So they go to Jerusalem. They head to Jerusalem. And when they arrive... Mary comes out to meet Jesus, but Martha holds back. I can almost see Martha with her arms folded, not wanting to meet the gaze of Jesus at first, and then glaring at him. In verse 21, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Listen to her words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Where were you, Jesus? I needed you. <laughs> no doubt she prayed fervently that God would spare her brother. And for the limit of her understanding at the moment, she felt abandoned by God. She felt that Jesus had left her out in the cold. She felt that Jesus had not answered her prayer. But remember, Jesus said, It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The irony of the story is that Martha didn't realize that Jesus was there with her all the time. Jesus was there beside her all the time. And even as he wept, he told the crowd to come, or told her to come, show him where did you leave him, where have you buried him. And Jesus stood in front of the tomb for all to see and spoke. And Lazarus walked out of that grave. Lazarus walked out of that grave. Amen. Amen? What a testimony. Now, we talked about the power of a shared testimony. Jesus said, this is done so that God may receive glory. From that, if we look at Scripture, all of those witnesses saw with their own eyes that a dead man walked out of a tomb, that Jesus had called him back to life, that that miracle was performed by none other than this Messiah, the Son of God. And do you know there were people there witnessing that day who saw that and they believed in Jesus and they fell on their knees and worshipped him. But there were others who, in spite of that magnificent miracle, in spite of that undeniable miracle, they looked and saw this cannot be. And from that day they conspired to arrest Jesus 
and to put him to death. This cannot be. My friends, sometimes even the most marveling, marvelous, undeniable testimony can be denied by those with hearts of stone. Denied by those with hearts of stone. Now, when Jesus told, Martha came to understand now that what happened was for the greater glory. Martha saw it. Martha understood it. But remember, she had prayed for God to be on her side. So let's remember that. When we're praying, be careful not to pray and ask God to follow you around and, make, and, and uh, give the outcome that you want. But instead, pray and ask God. Let's, uh, let me, I want to pray and ask God to help me see God's outcome. God, where are you in this? How can you be glorified in this situation? I don't understand this. I don't understand why this week my dad was back in the hospital again for several days after, sir, after coming home from surgery. But praise God, he's well and back home. But that's for God's glory. We can't understand always, but I ask God to help me to trust in him and have my faith in him. And that's the, test, that's the true testimony, is that through the situation, through whatever it was, that our trust relied on God. And I tr my trust was on Him and Him alone. All right, so that's the couple of if statements. Now let's go to the then statements. Look in verse 2, Isaiah chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm uh, 124, verse 2. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side when people rose up against us, when people rose up against us, verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 3, then verse, uh, they would have swallowed us up alive. I'm just going to read these. I'm going to read verse 2 through 5 and then go back, and uh, we'll, we'll take them apart as we go. Let me just read those five, four verses. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side when people rose up against us, verse 3, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. So, The psalm here begins by telling Israel to rely completely on God. And if it had not been for God, then these three things would have happened. There's imagery of uh, angry people swallowing us up. A flood, a torrent overwhelming us. And then drowning in raging waters. Now... One way we can look at this is that the flood is a metaphor for the danger that David faced with his enemies. We could take it only just that way, but I certainly think that's in there. That David was writing this home from the heart. That when he was being chased by enemies and God spared his life, he was giving God praise. It's also a metaphor for the trials, hardship, judgment, and exile suffered by Israel as a nation. Notice the language in here. It, is not, it does not say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side when my enemies rose up against me. No. It's, if the Lord had not been on our side when, my enemies, when our enemies rose up against us. So it's, it's we and us, not me, not I and me. It's we and us. But I can't help read this without thinking this is also and probably more so, a literal reference to one of the central miracles uh, in establishing the nation of Israel, one of the central miracles in rescuing the entire nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Remember the way that God rescued the Hebrews as from being slaves in Egypt? Uh, it's a very long story. Of course, you, we all know this. We're familiar with it. That, that the Israelites had been, or 
Joseph and all his brothers and all their children had been saved from a famine by having favor and living in Egypt in protection, under, under protection under, under Joseph during that time. But after many years and, uh, uh, had gone by and generations had gone by, eventually uh, the family of Joseph had become a great nation. And they were kept as captives enslaved in Egypt. And they were, slave, they were slaves there and forced to work. And the Egyptians were, had become afraid that the Israelites were growing too great in number. And there was an edict that all of the, the, uh, the baby boys would be killed. And remember the miraculous way that out of all this horror and terrible tragedy and death, one boy was saved, Moses, was Moses special? Was, Mo- was Moses smarter than everyone else? Was he wiser than everyone else? No. God chose Moses for a, for a purpose. God saved him and saved his life. Later on, we read that God ch- used Moses to uh, stand against Pharaoh and say, God uh, has, has told us to, uh, to let our people go and let, set us free. And there was a series of ten dramatic plagues that... Uh, uh, that occurred, and uh, God took uh, Moses and the Israelites through all these, uh, saved them through all these plagues. And finally, Pharaoh said, "I've had enough. Yes, get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. Leave, go." And they left. And so there was a multitude of people, a nation, leaving, had 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 fled from slavery in Egypt through this dramatic rescue. And God brought them to a place where they came to the edge of the Red Sea and they could go no further because they couldn't get across those waters. And don't you know, (laughs) God made it so that that Pharaoh changed his mind again and sent his army after them. And the uh, the chariots and the army of Pharaoh, the strongest army in the world, had came and chased after them. And they were pinched in between a flood on one side and angry people on the left. I'm going to read again. Verse 3. then Verse 2. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side when the people rose up against us, they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away or the torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Now if you go back to... Exodus chapter 14, and you read what's going on during that time. Now, remember, this is a multitude of people who are set free. I bet in all that multitude, there were many who really had no idea what was going on. All they knew was, hey, my parents told, me, told us it was time to move. And so we did. And here we all are going. There's a rumor that we're all being rescued and we're not going to be slaves anymore. And here we are. Tra- oh, my goodness, we can't get across that river. Oh, my goodness, we can't get across that sea. And, oh, here comes Pharaoh's army. Scripture records that they began to clamor against Moses and said, Are you just bringing us out here to die? We didn't want to leave. We want to stay. We want to be slaves still. I'm sure there were people there praying that God would send them back to Egypt for safety. Because slavery was better than drowning. Slavery was better than being killed by an army. But God planned all of this for His glory. Exodus chapter 14 verse 18. God says, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Exodus 14, 28 through 31. I'll just read that to you. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. So I know we all know this story, but just just for a reminder... How did God redeem them from this situation? He did it in a way that would be unmistakable. In a way that no one could look at that and say God didn't do that. When there was no way out, God told Moses to 
lift his hand over the water. And God separated the water of the Red Sea. And the Israelites were able to walk across on dry land. The army of Pharaoh followed them in to the Red Sea. And while they were there in the midst of the waters, God closed the waters back up over them and they drowned. What a horrible tragedy for the Egyptians. I'm sure the Israelites were praying for one solution. The Egyptians would have been praying for another. Don't know who they would have been praying to, but anyway, nobody really wanted to see that happen, but God did it. This was God's miracle. Now, as David looks back on that time, as the nation of Israel looks back on that time, now they see the hand of God. Now they can see how God preserved them. Now they can see that all of that previous was prelude to this additional miracle that God uh, performed to redeem them and to save them and to bring them up out of Egypt. The people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And if you look at Exodus chapter 15, most of that chapter is in song. It's the song of Moses. In fact, I'm going to... No time to read the whole thing, but I'm going to flip back to it just to read a little bit. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And and Moses' sister Miriam sang, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. So this miracle is what is being recalled here in this song. The people reading it now or singing it now or saying this psalm heading to Jerusalem, they lived centuries after this had had occurred. And still they said, remember when we, remember when God saved us. Grace Church, now, we may not be Israelites or Hebrews. We may not have lived in Israel. We may not have any, any uh, family or any roots there. But spiritually, we do. This is our spiritual heritage, too. The, uh, the, the, the line of the throne of the King David came through these people. And the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ, came through this people that were preserved here. And so we too can sing this psalm with them. Remember when God was with us, when our enemies were in, in, angry against us, when our enemies were chasing after us and God preserved, preserved us. Remember when the flood waters were there and we could have been drowned and God saved us. Remember that? Remember that? Praise God. Just singing that, just saying that makes me want to worship God. Makes me want to praise God. It makes my songs have more meaning. It makes me remember what God has done for me. It makes me continue to pray that God will uh, sanctify my life and help me to follow Him and serve Him. And then even more so to tell others about Him and to tell my children about Him and to remind people of what God has done in my life. All right, let's take a look here at verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7. We have some cause and effect effect statements. Verse 6. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. 
Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Verse 7. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. So I say these are cause and effect statements. That verse 6 is really an effect and a cause statement. The song says, bless the Lord. Now as a man, I really have no leverage or really no power to bless God. But in Scripture, when we say the term bless God, see, usually when you bless someone, you're blessing someone who is maybe your equal or someone who is below you in rank of some kind. You know, I can bless my children by saying kind things to them. I can bless a friend of mine by giving them kind words or saying some kind things. But when we say bless God, I'm not saying that God is under me. No, no, no. This is, what, this is an example that Scripture gives. When we, say, when we say bless God, what it means is God is blessed. God is blessed. God is blessed. No one really is high enough to bless God, to transfer anything to God. God is the source of all blessing. God is the source of all blessing and all life and all creation. But nevertheless, the psalmist says, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us his prey to their teeth. <clears throat> God preserved us. God has not given us over to our enemies. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. So, uh, this is, uh, in case you have to look up these words, I don't know if you want to look at your phone. Hey, Google, what in the world is a fowler? What in the world is a snare of a fowler? Did anybody have their phone on? Did it just, when I said that, did it turn on? No? Okay. Mine probably did in my pocket. Anyways, a fowler is someone who hunts birds, who is trying to, uh, trying to, to, trying to uh, um, capture a bird. Now, if you're hunting a bird to kill it and eat it, you might use a different a weapon uh, to uh, kill, kill the bird in flight or, or, or something like that. But a snare is to trap a bird, to keep it for some other purpose, to keep it alive for some other purpose. Uh, so a snare might be a, something that's a little bit more delicate. But a bird that is ensnared is, is uh, uh, you know, it's kept so that it can't fly away. It's kept for some other purpose. Sometimes, uh, uh, in the, you know, in these days, a, 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 a hunter might hunt a bird and capture it and keep it, tame it, and the bird would make its call to attract other birds of its type to that location so they could hunt more easily. If they had a trapped bird who would call out to these other birds, that was sometimes a reason to ensnare a bird. So the symbolism here of being a, a bird that is trapped by a fowler's snare, that's something we don't want. We don't want to be trapped by a fowler's snare. We want to, be a, we want to escape that. And so in verse 7 it says, The snare is broken and we have escaped. The enemy has not been able to keep us for his purposes, for his evil desires and his evil purposes. Uh, Psalm 91 uses this imagery as well, and so I'm going to read that for us. Psalm 91, verse, uh, three, uh, verse 1 through 3. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, and from the deadly pestilence. So what are some takeaways from this, uh, this section? First, we go to God for protection. We go to where He is for protection. He is our fortress. That means we're safe when we're in Him. We're safe when we abide in the Lord. We can call out to Him, but it's much better to abide in Him. The enemy lays a snare... Where would, where would you lay a snare for, to, trap your, uh, to trap someone? Where would the enemy lay a snare? Inside God's fortress or inside the fortress? No, outside. The enemy looks to try to pick off someone who's wandering, someone who's away from the flock or away from the fold. The enemy lays a snare for those who are away from the fortress. And uh, the fowler's snare is a symbol of slavery, a symbol of slavery to sin and the temptations of the flesh. The, 
praise God that the snare of the enemy is broken. The snare of the enemy is broken. It no longer has power over us. No longer has power to entrap us. Let's look now at verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, the end of this psalm calls back to the beginning of the psalm. where my, uh, it, it, Well, it call, calls back to two places. One, it calls back to the beginning of this psalm. It also calls back to Psalm 121, just a page over, if you have your Bibles open. Look at 121, verse 2. My help comes from the Lord who made what? Heaven and earth. So in, verse, in, in Psalm 121, the song is praising God that he made heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Notice, though, the beginning of this, that, that first little word, that two-letter word, my. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now it is our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. You see how there's a change there? Now together we worship God. Um, then uh, also calling us to the, the, uh, the blessing of and the power of the name of the Lord. Scripture is full of reference to the power of the name of the Lord, but one of my favorite references here is in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Verse, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 24. Now that passage that I was reading to you before, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, was a testimony that uh, Peter was giving when he was being called out for preaching in the name of Jesus. And the authorities were trying to tell him not to preach in the name of Jesus. And he said, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. I must preach in the name of Jesus. And as God would ordain it, he, was, he, and, his, he, he and those with him were allowed to uh, go back uh, to their, go back, I guess, to their, to their homes or to back, back to the other Christian believers. And when they gave that testimony, they said, well, how did, you, how did they let you go? God, God ordained it that we were, uh, that we were able to, to, to leave, and we will continue to preach in the name of the Lord. And this is the reaction of those who heard Peter's testimony in verse uh, 24 of Acts chapter 4. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. I love hearing those words that God is sovereign, that He made the heaven, He made heaven and earth. That means God made everything. That means everything here is by His grace and mercy that it even exists. The fact that we're alive today, the fact that we can gather together today, the fact that we're here, the fact that we're even alive to have problems that we need to pray about is, is a gift and a blessing of God. He made it all. Everything we're involved in is for His glory, not mine, not yours, not ours. Sovereign Lord who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. Okay, so now what? So why, why is this psalm here? Why are they making these declarations as they're ascending to worship God? Well, first of all, as I mentioned to you, when I began, I mentioned to you that testimony of when I was a boy and prayed to God and uh, when I was lost, me and my cousin, and how we trusted in God and he protected us and we found our way home. Do you know that even now when I tell that story, the recollection of my feelings and my emotions of that time are, uh, rise up in my mind and in my heart? And the comfort that I felt when we finally found our way home. And I knew that I didn't find my way home. My cousin didn't find his way home. That God gave us the direction to go. And today, even to this day, when I hear of a, 
some, you know, a child who's lost and that they're searching for that child, I pray, I stop and pray and ask for God to lead that child home the same way he led me home that day so many years ago. I can identify more deeply with that. That's the power of a testimony. Now, that testimony is personal. My cousin and I share that. But here in this psalm, they're reviving a te- or re- re- recalling a testimony that the entire nation has in common. We were slaves in Egypt. We were saved. We were brought out of Egypt. We were on the shore about to drown in the Red Sea. We were about to be devoured by the army of Pharaoh, and God preserved us and spared us. And Christians, we can say that today. We were there. Each and every one of us have a shared testimony. We were lost. If you believe and trust in Jesus, if you know who he is and you know that only Christ can, say, can forgive your sin, you know that because you were told that message. And God, with his Holy Spirit, softened your heart to hear it. And by his grace, he brought you home into his kingdom. You alone, not your family, not your church, not somebody you know, not a priest. Nobody can do this for you. Only God and you. We all share that same testimony. All of us who are redeemed by Christ, we share that same testimony that God called us in that moment and in that time when our ear would hear and our heart would listen and we bowed our knee and begged for salvation. So, when we gather together and we share our corporate testimonies together, it's a way to prepare for worship. And we recall God's goodness. It's also an example to others. When we tell them what God, I tell them what God did for me, what God did for us. Now, what are our testimonies? <laughs> Many of you probably now are thinking, or have thought of a time when God, when you prayed or God answered a prayer and it was very personal. If you told somebody else, they may not believe it or understand it. They may feel like it was a coincidence, but not to you. To you, you know that was God talking to you. And there's no mistake. You believe it and you know it. You have any testimonies like that? If you don't, or if, if you don't have any, you need to get some. <laughs> Spend some time praying to God. Let your request be made known to God. Implore his name. Begin your day that way. Ask God to turn your heart and mind to be in his will, to live for him and to do his will. Call upon the name of the Lord over the situations that you come in contact with and just see what God will do. Just watch and see what God will do. If you do have those testimonies, who have you shared those with? Share it with somebody. Share it with somebody. Tell your children. Tell your children. Some of my greatest treasures are the testimonies that my uh, parents or grandparents have told me about when they prayed and God answered their prayer. Very personal, but very real. Tell your children your testimonies. Standing here, I can remember as a, as a group at Grace Church, we have, a te- we have some testimonies. <laughs> My goodness, if we actually spent time and just tried to remember all of the things we've prayed for together and all the ways God has answered prayer, we may never go home all week. Wouldn't that be something if we were if we did that and we were still here uh, when all of our when Justin and Brandon get back and we were still testifying? Um, But here, just here's just a couple of examples. Do you remember uh, last uh, last winter? Back in February 2021, when everybody was out of power and our building here, we, we had power. We had, we had heat. We had a, 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 a power to make meals. We were able to open our doors, and people in the community were able to come and stay alive and stay warm. And our, our first responders in the area were able to use this, this place as a, as a base. 
That's a testimony that our church can testify to. Now, why was our building still had, why did we still have power and and another uh, building down the road didn't? I don't know. I don't know. But it was God's mercy. And that's a testimony that we share. That God gave us an opportunity to be a t- to be an example in this community, and we and we we uh, uh, we share that memory. I remember with people here in this place going through neighborhoods, knocking on doors, to tell them to invite people to church, and if they didn't know Jesus, to share the gospel, and praying for their needs. I remember doing that. Do you remember doing that? Have you had a chance to do that with people here? Do you remember, the, of course, can't talk about testimonies of our church without remembering the tornado so many years ago now. It's been over five years now. But uh, why was our church spared and the one right down the street was not? I don't know. But we were able to open our doors and uh, join together, even with a church down the road that we may not necessarily agree with 100% in every doctrinal way. But we, don't, we believe that Christ alone forgives sins. And we were able to share uh, with another body of believers and uh, open our doors to uh, our, a, a, a Parents' Day Out, that they were able to maintain that Parents' Day Out for people in the community, even people who didn't believe in Christ. And they saw the, the power of the fellowship of salvation here. And I pray that through that testimony, some people will come to the Lord. As I was preparing this message, I think of all of the many, 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 many people we prayed for over the years. But for some reason today, I remember Ken Webster. I remember praying for Ken Webster. And I remember that uh, how much he loved the Lord. And how knowing, sick with cancer, yet as much to the to the vet, to, to the extent of his ability, if he was well enough to be here, he would be here with that cross around his neck. Remember that big wooden cross he wore toward the end? And it was a blessing to be able to pray with Ken Webster. I thank the Lord for this church body. And I know we all do. But that's the value of worshiping together and coming together. And in this psalm, when the people of Israel are getting ready to worship God and they remember their shared testimony, Grace Church, we can too. We can too. Bow with me, if you would. Heavenly Father, we glorify your name. We give you praise and we give you glory. And we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the miracle of your word. We thank you for uh, the love that you give to us uh, as we gather together. I, uh, Heavenly Father, we pray for health and for strength for those among us who are ill uh, and, and, and sick. We pray for, your, for, for them to be well. But more than that, Lord, we pray for your will to be done. We pray that you're glorified in their lives. Whether you preserve them in health or you take them home, O oh God. We pray that your name be glorified. Lord, we pray uh, for uh, the seminary in Columbia, that uh, you will train and equip those who will teach the gospel to many, many, uh, countless others, and that your word will be proclaimed, and that you will be praised wherever your word is pre- preached. Lord, we pray that you bring our youth uh, back safely home and keep them safely there, that their time in Memphis will be uh, uh, fruitful, that uh, the families and children that are touched there will, be, uh, uh, will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray that lives will be changed. We pray for any young person that's there on that trip who may not even be a believer, but it's just went to the trip because their friends did, that you'll take time to speak to their hearts And convict them and show them that there's only salvation in you alone. Salvation is only in you alone. Lord, we thank you for for this and, and for all these. In the precious holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.